today's guest was beginning his major league career, Ted Williams signed an autograph to him that read, to assure Hall of Famer. Williams was prescient, good word, huh, John? Whoa. Because on his plaque in Cooperstown, it reads that he redefines standards by which catchers are measured during 17 seasons with the Big Red Machine. This two-time MVP wasn't just the greatest all-around catcher of my era, but of all time. I welcome my friend Johnny Bench. How are you? Thank you. Very high praise coming from you. Thank you very much. Nice well, to be with you. Well, it's, it's high praise because it was deserved. Mm. When, when Ted Williams signed that autograph to you, I mean, how could this guy know? I mean, it was about like back in 1969. It right? was. Yeah, it was in spring training, and I wanted to get a, a ball signed, and I asked, uh, I think it was uh, Roy Seavers to go over and ask for me. Uh, and he said, sure, and he, he went in and handed him the ball, and he handed it back to me, and I didn't read it, actually, till I got back to uh, towards the dugout. You had played one year in the I'd Major I played Lincoln one year, staff. and, I, and I'm, I'm looking around. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I don't know about candid camera or anything about it this time, but I'm at the point where it's saying, Ted Williams actually knows who I am? And until you really, until later on when I had the baseball bunch and I, and I actually did a show, uh, we had Ted on as a, as a guest. Mm -hmm. And the night before, we were at dinner. And he's, we're sitting there, and I'm sitting next to him, and he says, uh, what do you think makes a curveball curve? And I said, well, I think it's the rotation of the earth as it goes around in the ball. And, and I turned away really quickly, and I never, because we were at the end of dinner, and I never said <laughs> another word to him. And so I, we, we go, everybody goes to the room, and I get up the next morning, and I'm picking him up to take him to the park. He hasn't closed the door. What do you mean, the rotation of the earth? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you, are you talking about when the seams hit the air, when they pull down on the seams and the, and the pull of the rotation on the seams and it hits the air? Son of, he said, you had me up all night. I can't even believe that. And that's, that's the way he was. John, I remember, and I, I'm not trying to overflatter you or anything like that. That's oh, okay. Go ahead. That's okay? Yeah, fine. That's, I used to sit on the bench, and I used to look at you catch, and I would ask myself, how does he do that? How did you do that? I didn't have any other way of doing it. And I'll tell every catcher and every kid that ever wants to pick up a mitt, when parents ask me, what do I tell my kid? He wants to be a catcher. I said, catch every ball. Mm -hmm. And then that's the way life is. You, if you, no matter what profession you're in, if you catch every ball, that's what it was. I had no flexibility. I've never touched my toes in my life. I, I, my what? L5 grows into my hip. I have never touched my toes <laughs> in my life. I have no flexibility whatsoever. <laughs> And so People I. People are out there saying, what? Johnny Bench has no flexibility? Tim, when I was 17 years old and I signed, I went for my physical with the Tampa Tarpons. They sent me to the doctor to get okayed. He said, all right, touch your toes. I said, I can't touch my toes. And I got to the top of my ankle somewhere around there. And he <laughs> said, son, unless you get some more flexibility, you're never going to be able to play. And so. Uh, I started using the round glove like everybody did. I had been up to watch the Cardinals and Daryl Griffith, who played with the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. They were playing, and, and I got a, I had got to a, use I got a glove by, from Jeff Torborg. Mm -hmm. his, his, he gave one of uh, my, my, his brothers, Daryl Griffith's brother. And so I, I had this glove, you know, and I'm like this, and I broke my thumb, and then I split my thumb, and I said, this is crazy. I mean, here's Randy Hundley catching 160 games, and he's using right. a one-handed glove, and mm -hmm. I think even Elston Howard had used it a little bit. And I said, the only way I can stay in the lineup is if I could use the one-handed glove and keep my hand out of the way. And so I started using the one-handed glove, and, you know, I started backhanding stuff and doing things that uh, just came natural. I mean, I, I was trying to catch every ball. I was blessed with my father's hands, and I don't know. I never, I never thought about it. I, everything was reactionary to me. But ble blessed with your father's hands. Your father must have had. He played semi-pro ball in Binger, right? Binger, Oklahoma. It's, yeah, he served two hitches in the war. Didn't get to play. Uh -huh. uh, played some semi-pro against Satchel Paige huh. and the likes of that. Really? Love to tell the stories. Really? But you know, his dream was for he wanted to play so badly, and then he wanted one of his kids to play. And I was the the third son. I called. I saw Mantle playing on TV one day. The announcer said that here's the next superstar switch hitter from Oklahoma. And I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, you can be from Oklahoma and play in the major leagues? <laughs> That's what I want to be. And he said, well, catching was the quickest way to the major leagues and what the major leagues needed. 
that Binger had set 760 people. 661, yeah. 661. Yeah. So I'm so Graduating class of 21. Graduating class of 21. How far was Commerce, Oklahoma, where Mantle was from? Oh, long from way. Binger. Oh, long is that right? Way. Yeah, it was all the way at the corner of the state. It was up near Missouri almost. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if we ever got, we, were, we rode the back of the pickup truck up to Oklahoma City. It was 55 <laughs> miles. I mean, that was a road trip. We're going to talk about Binger, Oklahoma, and Eakley, Oklahoma. I know that's going to draw you right after this. Back with the binger banger, Johnny Bench. <laughs> <laughs> you hadn't heard that in a long no, time. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I was... we, we told you we we're going to tell you about Eakley, Oklahoma. Uh, a pitcher by the name of Mike Moore was pitching in the 1989 Earthquake Series. We're trying to find out where Eakley, Oklahoma is. I tap on the window. Johnny's doing radio with Jack Buck. Tap on the window, window and bring Johnny over. And I said, where's Eakley, Oklahoma? He said, right near Binger. Yeah, 12 miles, 13 miles. So we're miles. trying to find out where Mike Moore was from. And I thought that you said your brother get, delivered him gas, but you did. I did, yeah, I did. Well, my, my dad had a propane business. <laughs> we had liquefied petroleum gas. We drove, and I drove the gas truck. And, and I would go up there and load the truck. And I, I was only 15, you know, when I was doing this. And I would go up there and I would take those valves. And I would try to tighten them so tight my dad couldn't undo them. And of course, then I'd ride up to the gas, up to the loading place and, and dad would go, whew, whew, whew. you know, it was like. Yeah, was equally uh, bigger than Binger? Oh, no, gosh. <laughs> I mean, we were 661. They were like only 300 and 400 people. Yeah, I remember Steve Hurt called the fire department that day. They weren't open. The, the police department weren't open. He called and tried to wake up the town of Eakley, Oklahoma, and they were all watching the World sure Series. Sure they were. Well, that's like when I when I run Rookie of the Year, MVP of the Year, when I was MVP in 70, and we had a parade in Binger. I mean, you know, I had dignitaries from Cincinnati coming down. Doc Pfeiffer rode in the back of the uh, the uh, his convertible. He's the only guy that had a convertible in town. So I'm in the convertible, <laughs> and we've got all the cotton, you know, cotton trailers, and we've got them with those little put those tissues in there, and we've got them. Congratulations, Johnny, and everything else. And we what go down to the story. end of That's town, the cotton, and down to Opitz Gin. And Farmer's Gin was right beside it and right across my brother's gas station. And so we all got in line. And so now the parade starts, and we go uptown. Nobody's there. They're all in the parade. Everybody's in the parade. We got two drunk Indians come out of Mike's bar and say, hey, what's going on here? And so you, like, you had no spectators? Had Everybody nobody, was nobody. In, oh. No. I mean, we drove down, and we just... And then when we made the U-turn, then we were able to see each other mm -hmm. coming down. <laughs> the others as we were passing that by. Is a great <laughs> this, is like, this is what we did. But, so you know, <laughs> uh, that's that's fat. well. We talked about the uh, the uh, the World Series and the earthquake and everything. I followed your lead when it Get hit out, on October 17th at 5:04 p.m. I'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. And I didn't know how to react. I'd never been in one. And and you went by the booth and you motioned me and I took off and I side by side we went down. I got uh, right you, underneath that steel girder. Uh -huh. you know, yeah, been, right. I had been in enough of them. I knew that was the safest place. And then of course it was I mean it was just <clears throat> unbelievable. We'd had no idea what was going on in no. the bridges and the town and everything mm -hmm. else. But I mean those light standards were shaking and you know it seemed like it went on forever but it was a very short period of time but it did so much damage but then I came we went back to our booths and I walked into the booth and Jack who hadn't moved from Jack his seat, Buck. Jack Buck hadn't moved from his seat and he said if you'd have moved that fast when you played you wouldn't hit into a double play <laughs> <laughs> and it, that I guess that was life you mentioned the 1970 season I don't think any catcher I don't I, I don't think I know no other catchers ever had a year like that and it happened, you were what, 23 years old at the time? Yeah, I was uh, actually 22. 22. Uh, yeah, born in 47. And I, I just, you know, I, it was, everything was magical. I didn't think there was anybody to get me out. Um, I didn't, I actually approached hitting in one way. I always, uh, this is 1972, fifth game. Against Dave Justice. He's down, we're Change down two to away. one. Palm ball, hit in the air. Palm ball. Change, hit in the air, deep right field. Now, this is a home run, it's off. Vita Blue. This is a home run. That was in the All-Star game. No, this was 72, actually. Oh, the 72. home run I hit in, it was in the All-Star game off Vita. But this is the home game that series that went seven games. And we had a misjudged fly ball in a couple of plays that really hurt us. And we should have won that World Series. But um, I, was, uh, I was thinking about, you know, the different things back in 70 that 
I actually look I, I look breaking ball and and adjust it to the fastball. I mean, I, that's just the way, that's how <laughs> how quick I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't think there was anybody could throw a fastball by me. And then, then when you faced a Nolan Ryan or somebody like that who didn't sure. have a great breaking ball, it was something. But those were the days. And then 72, uh, the other MVP. And then, you know, two days after I turned 25, I had lung surgery. I had the, had the spot on my lung. You had the lesion? Yeah. Right. I was the first surgery of its kind, the staple surgery in history. And uh, but it, it changed after that. I never I never was the same. I mean, I really. Oh yeah. I mean, they cut muscle, they cut bone, they cut you know, and nerves. And no, it never was the same. I I was I was disappointed. I didn't do the things I really wanted to do in baseball. What else would you have wanted to do? Well, I mean, it did a lot. But I just I I think you know, carrying a ball club and and being so dominant being the one at the plate that could make the difference. Mm. And, I, and I lost a little of that edge. I n never, because I knew it wasn't as quick. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there wasn't, the, wasn't balls I was getting to. And, and there was throws that I, you know, was just this much off and stuff mm. like that. It doesn't take a lot as, you know, as a professional to know when the time to hang them up is or when you, when you really start to feel the down, downward trend. But, I, you know, I wanted to win more. I wanted to do more. It, it just it wasn't numbers or anything. It was just the idea of just being out there. I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. The one one thing I think I'm the most proud of in all my playoffs and World Series was I think I went 27 games without a stolen base. Mm -hmm. And you know that's the difference. That's things that that's the things that make the difference in mm -hmm. in in winning and losing. Because as a catcher, you know how much we like to control the game. Yeah, it was yeah. so much fun to to get a guy a pitcher. Mm -hmm. I mean, you catch Gibson, okay, and we I could catch Seaver and Gullet and those guys. But to be able to get a guy that didn't have the good stuff and to get him a win, yeah. gosh, yeah. you walked in that you walked into that clubhouse happier happier than he was because yeah. you knew the job that, that that went out there that day. We'll be back with more from Johnny Bench right after this. Back with a Hall of Fame catcher who once said, I can throw out any man alive. Of course, I'm talking about Johnny Bench. Where'd you get the confidence to throw out, to feel that you could throw out any man alive or hit any fastball? I don't know. I mean, where'd it come from? I, I mean, have you're no from idea. Baylor, I have no idea. I really don't. I mean, I just, I, I came to play baseball. I was always playing in the older leagues. I mean, I played older leagues. I mean, I played when I was, you know, when I was 14, older guys, I, 14 I was playing American Legion baseball, 17 and 18 year olds, and I was always a couple of years ahead. And I, I don't know. I just assumed that I was supposed to play Major League Baseball. And uh, the first time was I came up was when we played the Cardinals in Cincinnati. And here's Brock, man. I got a chance. Maybe you know. Okay, fine. Here's here's Lou Brock. All right, he's all he's it. And so he hits a double. I said, oh, geez. Wait a minute, he's getting a big lead off second. Maybe he hadn't heard of me. <laughs> maybe I'll just maybe I'll just throw it through a car wash and not get it wet. Maybe I'll just pick him off second base real quick. So he, on next pitch I gave a little nods to the shortstop. So Lou gets that big hop, big lead again, and I come up firing. Threw a just a rocket down to second base, and Lou just walked over to third. <laughs> <laughs> it was like he just looked at me like it was just nothing at all to be done in it. I mean, it was great. It was a great learning curve. Everything's every every sure, time you're out sure. there. The guys who are the successful guys don't make the same mistake. But but to prepare for it, John, your dad used to have you throw to short center field. Oh yeah, throw, yeah. 150, 200 feet. Mm -hmm. I would stand. I, I mean, I take the I took every slat out of our shed. We had a shed. I put a <laughs> coffee can up on that shed, and I'd stand there and I just I was I mean I was 75 and three lifetime pitching. In in, wow. in little leagues, wow. and you know, I just I but I would stand out there and I would throw at that can and throw at that can and I'd back up and throw at that can and I'd try to take the boards out and my dad never said a word. I hit every rock out of the driveway twice. Gravel he he'd put another load in the driveway and I'd hit I'd stand out there with that bat split in half and I'd hit every rock. We played ten can in the backyard. I mean ten can with an old mill nut can and we'd throw it and you know you hit it a couple of times. You have to hit it in the air a certain distance. But if you hit it a couple of times. All of a sudden, you got some dents in it. Now you can throw screwballs, you can throw curveball sliders, and then it became a little missile, man. I mean, then it became a little just a, a pee, a, you know, and you rocket the thing. But that's what our life was about. You worked in the fields, you played basketball, you played baseball, played home run derby down at the park. Mm -hmm. And how I got to where I was, I mean, as far as you know, cocky, and uh, 
I mean, I, oh, yeah, I, I, I always never call, consider you cocky. I always I called my inner you... conceit. I think that was mm -hmm. the main thing that people have to have. An inner conceit is an ability to be better than the situation. Mm -hmm. So I never took it up on myself. My team was the most important thing, and I, I had to do what I had to do. I don't think I ever saw a guy who could transfer the ball from the mitt to the hand any more efficiently than you did. Mm -hmm. Some guys could do it quickly, but not if it, Thurman Munson could do it quickly. Oh yeah, but he did, he threw the ball. Yeah, but he uh, never you know he, he never got it. He never got here. it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that That's exactly the, right. But he had to make up for it because he didn't have the arm. I mean, it was just just amazing. This is what we're talking about with the transfer, from the, from the glove to the hand, to the throw. Now you can't be any quicker than that. Well, I make my I make the kids in the minor leagues. I you know. Uh, I think everybody laughed about that because that was Paul Blair trying, looking down saying, how in the hell did he throw me out? <laughs> he said, I was already through all the way to third. But I think that my kid, every time you play catch, you're working on transfer. And, and I, mean, I don't think there's anything else. It's just, I mean, it's just until you just can't do it. And, you know, I was, I'm from here to 15 feet. I'm as fast as anybody. From mm -hmm. after that, I'm done. But, mm -hmm. but everything is just a reaction. I know. That's what my dad said. You throw it by your ear, you catch the ball, you do it, and everything else. And that was hard to do because I pitched more than I ever caught. Everybody knew I was a catcher, but we—I mean, I was—I I pitched the, the six games our high school when I when every final we won the state championship, and we had a kid that would play third or catch but wouldn't play third. Then I went to the uh, American Legion baseball, and they already had a catcher. I had to go to another town, uh -huh. so I played first. Then I played third. Everybody knew I was a catcher, but I didn't catch. I mean, it was just amazing. And, what and, a great life, a catcher that didn't catch. I think I caught 17 games in American Legion Baseball. The Reds had no clue who I was. I got drafted by the Reds. They had no clue who I was. In mm -hmm. fact, Jim McLaughlin was in a hotel in Baltimore. Uh, some of the scouts were sitting around. It was the first free agent draft. They said, what do you think of this kid bench? And Jim said, ah, we're not that high on him, and walked out. I said, who's bench? And they sent in Tony Rebello and, uh, and uh, Bob Thurman. Saw me play two games, like the way I catch. And the Baltimore was interested, and the Reds draft me second round. What yeah. a prize! Cincinnati Reds signed Johnny Bench and gave him ten thousand dollars as a bonus. We'll be back with Johnny right after this. Earlier in the show, you heard Johnny Bench talk about the 1972 World Series, saying that they should have beaten the Oakland Athletics. You, you never forget that, but there were a lot of things that happened in your career that uh, that that were so good you can't bemoan. Uh, uh, you know some of the bad yeah, things can. that happened. Oh, you can. Oh yeah. Oh, it's my right. One of them no, wasn't I have the right. One the of them wasn't beating the Phillies in 1976 when you and George Foster hit, or George back Foster and you back-to-back -back home back runs. You remember to, that. To Clint. Do I ever? Do we I was in the bullpen that day. That's the only reason we won. <laughs> That's the only reason we won. That's saying the you know, right I, thing on the right show. The great moment of my career, and I hope, and, and I want to hear yours, was the 75 World Series when we won. Mm -hmm. And uh, being an MVP, being a Rookie of the Year, and doing all that other stuff is great. But you have to call people to have a party. <laughs> you walk into that locker room after you're, you win the world championship, and there are 25 players, all the coaches, the trainers, uh, equipment man, and you're all world champions. I don't think there's any greater moment in anybody's life than to be a part of that. So I was blessed to have two world championships. People say they don't miss it, but, I mean, they, you know, they've had a great career, but they're right. That ring is important. But, but I, I, that, I had uh, I had two also in 1964 four. and 1967, right. and and when Gibson came back on two days rest after pitching a 10 inning game in Game Five to beat the Yankees five to two, and then come back in Game Seven and he won seven to five, pitched a, uh, a complete game. Those are things that you never, never never forget. I had no idea that the Hall of Fame was waiting for me. I don't think that any youngster ever dreams of that or ever thinks that's possible because that is a place for the fantasies. That is the place for the Cy Youngs and the Babe Ruths and the Lou Gehrigs, for the greatest players who ever played this game. And now to be a part of them and share with them this plaque to hang on the wall and to be a part of the greatest thing that's ever happened in my lifetime and in a lot of people's lifetime to be a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame, to quote one person who probably made catching more important outside of Roy Campanella, a guy by the name of Yoki Berra said, it's not over till it's over. 
Yogi, it's over. We have made it. And thank you very much. Back with the final segment from Johnny Bench. We've had fun during this break. <laughs> Johnny, I finally got you on. Thank you very much. My pleasure. We'll see you next time. <laughs>